Hello, I'm Don Colby, Senior Research Physician at the Henry Jackson Foundation and the U.S. Military HIV Research Program. Today, I'm going to give a presentation on an update on STI prevention and treatment. Uh, and actually, uh, during 2021, we had a lot of news on STIs, uh, so there's a lot to cover today. These are my uh, disclosures and disclaimer. Let's start with a little bit of uh, epidemiology. So. Um, uh, worldwide STI incidents uh, for the latest year that we have data, 2020. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the other STIs um, uh, that we don't necessarily always think about as STIs, uh, like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, worldwide there's about 1.5 new infections of each one of those uh, uh, diseases every year. But let's see uh, for the other more traditional STIs how many there are. So syphilis, uh, over 7 million new infections per year. Gonorrhea, 82 million new infections. Chlamydia, 128 million new infections. And trichomonas, uh, 156 million. So we can see for STIs, many, many uh, more new cases every year than there are for other um, viral diseases uh, like uh, HIV or hepatitis B um, or C. But we know that um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV um, uh, have much higher rates of mortality uh, in the hundreds of thousands. Most STIs uh, are treatable or, or curable, uh, so much less of a uh, issue with mortality, uh, although they do have a, a high impact in terms of morbidity. But that does not mean that there is not mortality from STIs. So uh, congenital syphilis, as we know, syphilis is rising throughout the, the world. Uh, as we see more syphilis in heterosexuals, we also see um, more congenital syphilis cases uh, from mother to child transmission. And the estimate is about 200,000 deaths per year from congenital syphilis. The other STI that we see um, uh, impact mortality is cervical cancer. Of course, cervical cancer is caused by HPV, which is a vaccine preventable uh, STI, and we'll have more about that later. In the Asia Pacific, there's a, a very high burden of STIs. Uh, in fact, the Asia Pacific has the highest number of uh, STIs of any region in the world, which is not surprising because the Asia Pacific also has the highest population uh, in the world. Uh, syphilis, there's about 1.5 uh, million new infections uh, per year in the region. Uh, and then gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomonas uh, all have in the range of 40 to 50 million new infections uh, per year just in, in this region. So in terms of disease burden and impact on individuals and healthcare systems, uh, it, it's very, very high in the region. But before we get into um, issues of diagnosis and, and, and treatment, um, we start got to start with the basic. Um, so, uh, and the basics is is determining who's at risk and who we're going to screen for HIVs for uh, STIs. So, uh, we we know that the CDC came out with new guidelines for uh, STI uh, treatment, uh, and we'll go over those uh, shortly. Um, but concurrently with the new guidelines on treatment the CDC published uh, new guidelines for taking a sexual history. So this is very important because uh, if we're going to do screening or, or, or testing or, you know, prevention, uh, we have to know who's at risk. Uh, and pretty much uh, any um, survey of primary care uh, providers or, or patients finds out that, that um, uh, in, in most medical settings, um, patients are not asked about their, their um, uh, sexual practices or their sexual risks. So the, the, the guidelines from the CDC uh, use the five Ps um, as a sort of a prompt for uh, what should you do when you're taking a sexual history. So the five Ps are, are, are partners, you know, who are their partners, what gender are they, uh, practices, what kind of sex are people having, is it oral sex, uh, penile vaginal sex, anal sex, uh, protection from STIs, what are people doing, are they using condoms or, or not, um, are people on PrEP. Uh, past history of uh, STIs helps to know um, who may be at 
risk for STIs in the future. Uh, and then um, uh, pregnancy intention uh, is important uh, as well in terms of condom use or, or other um, uh, use for contraceptives. So these guidelines um, are available from the CDC on the CDC uh, website and go into this in much more detail than we can go into right now. So sticking with the P's for the next uh, few slides, um, how about PEP and PrEP for STIs? So we all know about PEP and PrEP for HIV because we talk a lot about that and we've been uh, working on that for a long time. Um, but we also have um, prophylaxis for STIs as well. There's been a couple of studies in, in the recent past that uh, give us a little bit of data on this. So in terms of uh, PrEP, there was uh, one very small study with 30 MSM that were randomized to either doxycycline, 100 milligrams per day, or control. Uh, in control, basically, they just didn't take anything at all. And, you know, in this small group, in a small study, that they found a 73% reduction in, in incidence of uh, com combined STIs with syphilis, uh, gonorrhea, and chlamydia uh, in the prophylaxis uh, group. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis has also been uh, recently evaluated, um, also using doxycycline. And this is a 200 milligram dose that was given uh, once as a single dose at 24 to 72 hours after condomless anal sex uh, and can be taken up to three times per week. So this was done in, in a group of MSM that was a, uh, a subgroup of the IPERGAY study. And the IPERGAY study, uh, you may remember, is a study that gave us event-driven uh, PrEP that was done in uh, France and, and Canada. So um, this was in the same group. And what they found was a set also a 70 to 73% uh, decrease uh, in syphilis or chlamydia incidence, but they didn't find any change in gonorrhea incidence um, either. So these are two studies. Uh, neither one is, is very big. Not enough to um, change uh, recommendations or guidelines at this point, but what I can say is that there are a number of ongoing trials uh, now to look at this, um, uh, mostly using doxycycline for either PEP or PrEP or some combination. So I expect that over the next few years, as we get results of these studies, we'll be hearing a lot more about this. And, and maybe in the future, we will have a recommendation uh, on using PEP or PrEP for STIs. Um, Pre-exposure, uh, we also have uh, vaccination as a, as a way to um, uh, prevent STIs. So um, we have vaccines for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Those are sexually transmitted uh, infections, uh, but we're not gonna talk too much uh, about those uh, in this presentation. Um, but we can talk a little bit more about the HPV vaccine. So HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. We have a, um, uh, a vaccine for it. In fact, we have four vaccines that have been uh, approved and are available in, in the market. Um, and they, they differ in terms of like how many HPV types they protect against. So all of them protect against the, the, the two most common oncogenic strains, uh, which are HPV 16 and 18. These are the strains that most likely uh, or most frequently cause uh, cervical cancer or can cause anal cancer um, as well. So the US CDC indications for the HPV vaccine are males and females nine to 26 years old. The, ideally, the vaccine would be given before people become sexually active um, because once you become sexually active, there's a high risk for um, uh, being exposed to HPV because HPV is so, so common. Uh, in the new guidelines, um, they also add a uh, indication um, for males and females from 27 to 45 years old. Um, and this is um, uh, based on what they call shared clinical decision-making or discussion between the provider and, and the patient about their risk for HPV infection if they're not adequately vaccinated. And since these vaccines are relatively new, uh, many people in the older age group um, uh, never had the chance to be vaccinated because when they were 9 to 26 years old, the vaccines uh, did not exist. So that's something we can think about our, on our um, older patients. And I know in my practice, um, I have given the HPV vaccine, mainly to MSM who are older, maybe uh, in their 30s or, or 40s, um, and uh, still had uh, ongoing risk behavior. So that is an option for our older patients. Uh, on the topic of uh, HPV, I want to um, uh, announce that there has been some uh, results announced from the Anchor study. So the Anchor study is a, a large study uh, that was conducted in the USA 
almost uh, 4,500 people living with HIV who had HPV infection and had precancerous anal lesions known as uh, H-cell, which is high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. And this included males, females, and transgenders, so, so all genders. And uh, participants were randomized either to treatment of these precancerous lesions, which means to de destroy the lesion in some way, and there's a couple of different ways they can do that, or observation where they didn't treat them at all, but had them come back every six months and continue to screen for um, transition to uh, cancerous lesions. And this study was actually stopped early in October 2021 by the DSMB because the treatment significantly reduced the risk for progression to anal cancer. Now they haven't released any other results of this study yet. So how much was the reduction? Um, uh, how many people actually went on to develop cancerous lesions? They haven't given us any of that data yet, but I expect that that will be coming out uh, sometime in 2022. And uh, still going on the P's, uh, don't forget partners. So, um, of course, a sexually transmitted infection uh, was transmitted from somebody to your patient. So anytime you have a, a patient with a STI, that means there's at least one other person out there somewhere who has the STI that they, they got it from. So um, the, the, the best thing is to encourage your patients to inform their sexual partners you know, that they have an STI, what it was, and then that, that their sexual partner should also uh, come in and be seen, you know, by you or uh, anywhere else. Just get, get um, screened and treated for their STIs. Uh, one thing you can do is say, if, if, if you're going to bring your patient back at some point in the future, say, you know, bring your, your partners with, with you and we can treat uh, at that time. Um, there has been some evidence that um, if you give the your patient some written information about the STI that they can show their partners, that that actually uh, improves uh, referral rates. But if um, there's situations where the, 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 it's difficult for the, the partner to, to come in or for the patient to refer the, the partner, you can do something that's called expedited partner treatment or EPT. And what that means is that you actually give an extra treatment course uh, to the patient for them to give the, the partner. And treatment course means you actually give them the medicine itself, not a, a prescription, because they found that if you give a prescription, sometimes people fill it, sometimes they don't, but actually giving the medicine for the patient to give their, their partner um, increases the rate of actual um, treatment uh, being received by the, the partner. So there's very good evidence um, that this works for uh, chlamydia in heterosexual uh, uh, couples um, in, uh, in that it uh, increases the success rate for partner treatment and also decreases the, the rate of recurrence of the STI in the primary uh, a patient. And the recommendation is to treat all sexual partners <clears throat> within the past uh, 60 days or if they had no partners within the 60 days to, to treat the most recent partner. Now there's less clear evidence for other STIs like uh, gonorrhea or syphilis, mainly because those we usually treat with uh, injections rather than pills, and it's harder to do that as uh, um, you know through through uh, a patient. Uh, also, less clear evidence for MSM. Uh, MSM have higher rates of STIs, often have multiple STIs, uh, and a higher risk for HIV, which we may screen for when we're screening for other STIs. So it's not recommended for uh, MSM as well. Uh, just one note on uh, STI testing. Um, the, the new standard for collection of STI uh, specimens for testing is self-collection. So in the old way, we would have the provider or a nurse, you know, swab, whatever orifice we're interested in, um, and, and then send that off to the lab. But there's a lot of um, uh, evidence that uh, if patients collect samples themselves, um, that the, the sensitivity and the specificity of the, the testing is comparable. Uh, much higher patient satisfaction when patients can do it themselves themselves. Uh, and there's also um, uh, better staff satisfaction as well, because it's less work uh, for the staff and less intensive um, as well. Uh, this can be done from uh, any site that we collect specimens from. 
uh, on the site, you you may notice that that we did not put urethra there. And for the male urethra, uh, now we tend not to swab those because most of our newer testing uh, in terms of net testing can be done on urine. So we don't necessarily need to, to swab the, the urethra. And it, it works for pretty much uh, any STI um, that affects the genital tract, the mouth or the, the anus um, as well. So you might ask, well, how do you do that? How do you give them instructions? Um, there's actually a lot of um, uh, patient materials in terms of posters or handouts that give very clear instructions for um, uh, patients on how to collect the specimen and, and what to do to the specimen. And there's some links to uh, where these um, uh, posters and materials can be found and downloaded. Okay, so now we're going to get to the uh, the new CDC guidelines that came out uh, in mid-2021. The previous STI um, guidelines from the CDC had come out in uh, 2015. Uh, so there were six years between the, these guidelines, and there's actually been a lot of changes um, in the interim. The, the newer guidelines are much longer, um, about 30% longer in terms of number of pages, and there's a lot of uh, new sections um, as well. So um, I won't have time to go through every single change in the guidelines, but we will be able to uh, hit the, the uh, highlights uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation. So first, just to note on the, the uh, nomenclature of the guidelines. Previous guidelines were called STD, or Sexually Transmitted Disease Guidelines, and uh, uh, CDC is catching up with most of the rest of the world, um, which uh, uses the terminology of sexually transmitted infection. Uh, the, the main difference is that uh, disease refers to a, a disease state, meaning symptomatic, um, where STI or infection refers to the pathogen, uh, which may be symptomatic or asymptomatic um, as well. Uh, some people think that uh, may be less stigmatizing um, as well. So the um, push now is to use the term uh, STI over uh, STD. So uh, one notable change in the new guidelines is um, a new section on STI screening for transgender persons. In the 2015 uh, guidelines, there was a small section that was about half a page that just basically said transgender people get uh, STIs and they should be screened, uh, but no specific um, screening recommendations. Whereas the, the newer guidelines have a much expanded um, uh, section with very um, specific uh, recommendations. Uh, for all transgendered persons, um, they recommend that the STI screening history examination be based on the, the um, patient's sexual practices uh, and the gender of their sexual partners. So HIV screening is recommended for all uh, transgender persons on, on a regular basis. Um, and transgender persons with uh, HIV are recommended to be screened annually for STIs. Uh, they do know that the transgender uh, Persons who have sex with cis men are at similar risk for STIs as MSM, and we know MSM have a very high risk for, for STIs, so that means that transgenders that are having sex with men uh, also have a very high risk for uh, STIs. In terms of transgender women who have had vaginoplasty, um, they recommend routine STI screening at all exposed uh, sites. Uh, in terms of the neovagina, uh, and doing um, STI testing, uh, there's no data uh, so far on whether we should do urine tests versus a, a vaginal swab uh, collection. So, so really either one of those is fine at this time because no evidence that one is better than the other. Um, the the um, neovaginal surgery does not create a, a, a uh, a cervix. So transgender women uh, do not have a cervix and do not need cervical cancer screening. Now for transgender men who have had surgery, um, if the, the, the vagina is still present, present uh, the recommendation is to use swabs over urine for bacterial STIs because that surgery actually um, changes the location of the urethra and it may be less susceptible to, to STI. So really swabs are better than urine. Uh, and for a transgender man that retained their um, cervix, they should have cervical cancer screening uh, per current guidelines for cis women. There's been a few changes um, in recommended treatment for STIs in, in the new guidelines. Um, uh, first, uh, for chlamydia, on the old guidelines, the recommendation was uh, azithromycin as the, the first um, um, 
uh, regimen um, uh, as a single dose uh, and, and uh, doxycycline as an alternative and then some other, several other alternatives um, as well. The new recommendation uh, is, is not to use azithromycin as a first line, but to use doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day with azithromycin um, reserved as a uh, alternative regimen. So why this change? Um, so, uh, and it's basically based on evidence that doxycycline is uh, more effective than azithromycin. So doxycycline is very efficacious at all anatomic sites where people can get uh, chlamydia. And they have noted uh, over the last few years, higher rates of failure of treatment in males, uh, not so much in females, but definitely in males. Uh, and then a study that came out in 2021 um, that showed that the doxycycline was much more effective for rectal infection in males um, with 100% cure with doxycycline versus only 74% with azithromycin. Um, so the recommendation now is the first line treatment is doxycycline. There's still some situations when azithromycin may be appropriate. For example, pregnant women uh, in whom uh, doxycycline is contraindicated, or if people have an allergy intolerance to doxycycline, or if you have a, uh, a patient who you just think is not going to take medicine for, for seven days uh, and can take uh, you know, a, one, uh, a one pill that you might even do as uh, directly uh, observed. So gonorrhea treatment uh, also has new recommendations. The previous recommendation <clears throat> was to use a, a shot of ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams, plus a single oral dose of uh, azithromycin. So one question I'd like you to um, uh, answer, at least in your head, uh, you don't need to, to say it out loud, is um, what was the rationale for adding azithromycin to ceftriaxone in the 2015 uh, guidelines. Uh, and my guess is, is that most people uh, misunderstand um, why uh, that was the case. And uh, two slides from now, I'll, I'll explain to you um, what, the real, what the reason was for azithromycin to be in the previous guidelines and why it has been taken out of the, the current guidelines. So the new recommendation is uh, to use ceftriaxone alone without azithromycin uh, and at a higher dose, uh, 500 milligrams uh, as a single IM uh, injection. Uh, and then there's some alternative regimens um, as well. So this is for um, uh, general infection or rectal infection. Um, there's a uh, alternative um, guideline for oropharyngeal uh, infection. Uh, and again, that has changed from ceftriaxone plus azithromycin to a single dose of ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams um, uh, as well. There's no alternative regimens uh, recommended, uh, basically, because there's no evidence that any other recommend. Uh, regimen is efficacious for treating oropharyngeal uh, gonorrhea. So, so why the change? So the, the, the change um, is to prevent antimicrobial resistance. Um, so the, the question I asked two slides ago was in the 2015 guidelines, why was azithromycin added to ceftriaxone? <laughs> I think most people think that the reason it was there was because uh, if people have uh, gonorrhea, they might have chlamydia as well, and we want to treat both uh, at the same time. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to assume, uh, but that's actually not correct. <laughs> so if you, if you read the, the 2015 guidelines um, carefully, <clears throat> that explains in there that the reason azithromycin was added was to prevent um, gonorrhea resistance to ceftriaxone from developing. So going back seven, eight years ago, when those previous guidelines were written, written there was a, a big concern that gonorrhea might become resistant um, to uh, ceftriaxone. And if that happened, we'd sort of run out of uh, ways to treat uh, gonorrhea. So azithromycin was added to the regimen um, as a second agent with a different mechanism of action to prevent resistance to um, ceftriaxone. Uh, now, as time has gone on, the, um, there's still a, a um, concern about resistance uh, developing, uh, but it hasn't developed at, you know, as to the degree um, or as quickly as people were worried about in the past. Um, but um, over the last few years, there's been emergent resistance 
to azithromycin in other organisms, uh, for example, strep pneumonia and uh, mycoplasma genitalium have increasing rates of resistance to azithromycin uh, based on you know, use of azithromycin and exposure to it as well. So the, um, the idea is to use azithromycin uh, less in the future so that other organisms uh, be, uh, do not develop resistance to the same degree. Uh, and it turns out that the higher dose of ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams versus 250 milligrams, is also very effective at, at preventing um, resistance. So that's why the change was implemented. There's also been some change in uh, treatment of non-gonococcal urethritis or, or NGU, um, and, and that's basically also changing from azithromycin to doxycycline, uh, again, for the, res uh, the, the reasons of preventing uh, emerging resistance to azithromycin and because doxycycline is uh, very effective for uh, treatment in this case. Uh, something else new in the, in the guidelines is, is a new section on mycoplasma genitalium. So in the previous guidelines, um, there was a little bit about M. genitalium, but it was um, incorporated into the section on uh, NGU. Uh, but in the new guidelines, um, uh, mycoplasma has a, um, a section all to itself. So in terms of the epidemiology, um, we know that the symptomatic infections um, uh, um, uh, can be seen in both males and females. Uh, in males, uh, there are a fairly high percent of the cases of NGU, um, the actual etiology is mycoplasma genitalium, uh, and then that's even higher in persistent or recurrent urethritis. For females, uh, we know that uh, infection with mycoplasma genitalium is associated with infertility, cervicitis, PID, and for pregnant uh, women, uh, can lead to preterm delivery or spontaneous abortion. Now, we have um, a lot less uh, data on asymptomatic infection and the significance uh, of that in either males or, or females. So there's no recommendation now uh, to either screen for asymptomatic infection or to treat it uh, if it was found. In terms of diagnosis, Mycoplasma is similar to chlamydia in, in that um, very, very difficult to, to culture in, in conventional um, laboratories. Um, so that's just not, not available to us. But there is a diagnosis um, through NAT or PCR uh, testing, which can be done on urine or on genital swabs. Um, now, there is um, high rates of macrolide resistance uh, found in Western countries, up to 90% in, in some places. Um, so that uh, uh, affects our, 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 our uh, treatment regimens, um, uh, but it also, uh, because it's important, um, they're starting to incorporate the genotypic resistance testing into the NAT diagnostics um, that should be available in the future. I don't think those are available yet, but it's something similar to the um, uh, gene expert in TB, uh, where when you send a, a test for uh, mycoplasma, you get a result which is positive or negative for um, presence uh, of, the, um, uh, of the bacteria, um, but it'll also give you a genotype test to tell if uh, the, um, the, the mycoplasma is resistant to macrolides, mainly azithromycin. So because of that, um, uh, the expectation that we'll have that um, um, uh, uh, genotypic resistance testing available in the future, the, the CDC guidelines incorporate that into the, the guidelines, even though most people probably don't have it available to them. Yet. But so, but anyway, in the old guidelines, there was no specific treatment recommendations for mycoplasma, but the new guidelines have a, a recommendation uh, based on if there's macrolide sensitivity or not. Uh, but either way, you start out with doxycycline uh, for seven days, and then if there's macrolide sensitivity, then uh, add azithromycin, or if resistant to macrolides, then the second drug is uh, moxifloxacin. And if you're in a situation where you just don't have the um, uh, uh, resistance testing available, which is probably most people uh, currently today, um, then the treatment uh, recommendation is doxycycline followed by moxifloxacin. Uh, PID treatment um, has some changes, uh, mainly the addition of uh, metronidazole uh, to the uh, other regimens um, or um, 
uh, uh, clindamycin uh, um, uh, as an alternative. And the reason for that um, is um, not that the, the regimen is any more um, effective at treating acute infections, um, but to prevent long-term uh, sequelae, such as infertility or ectopic pregnancy. Um, at both regimens, the old ones and new, re new ones, are equal in terms of treating um, standard STIs like gonorrhea or chlamydia, but the addition of metronidazole uh, results in higher clearance of anaerobic microbes from the upper genital tract, and the thought is that that will prevent uh, longer-term sequelae, such as infertility or ectopic pregnancy. And then uh, finally, uh, the last uh, treatment uh, change we're gonna talk about is trichomoniasis. Um, and um, that has changes in both the diagnosis and, and treatment. So our, our, in the old days, the, the diagnosis was primarily by wet mount microscopy, just visually looking at it and seeing it under the microscope. Uh, but now we have available newer tests um, using NAT technology, which are much more uh, sensitive. Um, for detecting infection. Um, the treatment uh, has also changed in, in the past. The treatment recommendation for uh, men and women was the same, um, uh, mainly a, a single dose of metronidazole, two grams orally, or uh, tenidazole as an alternative. The newer recommendations in, in the guidelines now recommend an extended regimen uh, of seven days for, for women. That's because there's been new um, uh, evidence that the extended regimen uh, results in better rates of clearance and lower rates of uh, recurrence. For men, the recommendation is still the two grams orally as a single dose. Um, and that hasn't changed uh, basically because there, there's no new evidence uh, for men. Uh, doesn't mean that the, that the two grams is any better than seven days um, for, for men, just that we don't have any uh, new um, uh, evidence for men that seven days is any better than, than two grams. So they left the recommendation uh, for two grams uh, as a single dose. So uh, that concludes the, the, the lecture. Um, thanks uh, for listening and hope you have a good day. Bye.